This is the case of missing Robert Linder, L-I-N-D-E-R. Here's what I can find about him. Robert Wayne Linder was 24 years old when he vanished from Chicago, Illinois on June 2, 1969. Wayne, as he was known, was attending DePaul University in 1969, majoring in business. On the day of his disappearance, he took a final exam, then went to a bank and withdrew some money. He was planning to put a deposit down on an apartment. This was the last confirmed sighting of Wayne. Wayne was from Arkansas, and his family still lived there while he was in Chicago attending college. The circumstances of his disappearance are vague. He must have been moving locally from one residence to another, as the final exam indicates he had been in Chicago long enough to complete one semester. I wish there was more information on him about where he was moving to and from, whether there were any issues that prompted him to move, were his belongings left at his old residence. I did a search in the Illinois De Unclaimed Property Database a source I occasionally use to look up missing persons. The only, I only found one entry for a Robert Linder with an address in Chicago, and I don't believe this to be the same person. We know he had a bank account in Chicago since he was known to have withdrawn money that day. As far as I can tell, Wayne had not been declared deceased. So if he had any money left in his bank account, even if it was only a few dollars, it would have been reported to the state and listed as unclaimed. Aside from the obvious theory that Wayne could have been robbed since he was just withdrawn a large sum of money, it's worth mentioning that his disappearance fell during a time when many young men were disappearing voluntarily to avoid the draft. It appears that Wayne had a twin brother named Mark. I'm not certain they were identical twins, but their yearbook photos look remarkably alike. Both brothers were involved in theater. Wayne had returned to Arkansas for his brother's wedding just months before he disappeared. Since his relatives lived several states away, it probably took some time for anyone to realize he was missing. His absence may not have been ex unexpected by roommates or neighbors since he was in the process of moving. If he is still alive, Wayne would be about 80 years old today. His mother passed away in 2014. Let me see what the date is on this. The, okay, so this is recent. This is from this year. His mother passed away in 2014, and her obituary listed him as deceased. There's very little about him on this page. Basically, there's a link here that takes you to the Charlie Project. The Charlie Project has, he was a white male, 24 years old at the time that he went missing, June the 2nd, 1969. He was five foot nine, 155 pounds, with brown hair and blue eyes. Um, and that's all it says. It doesn't say how much the money was that he withdrew. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that once he was reported missing and people started asking questions about him, someone from the bank, must have come forward and remembered seeing him come into the bank that day and take out some money. Otherwise, who who would have known that he did that unless they just went and traced his bank records? And it doesn't say the amount of money that he took out. Was it enough to travel on? Was it enough to leave the country on? Did he jump on a bus and head north to Canada? Or... Was it just a little bit of pocket money, you know, to eat on or something like that? Does it say that's all there is that I could find on him?
The next story is Stephen Lamb. Uh, this is from the website We're About Still Unknown. And these are just some older cases that don't have a whole lot of detail. Stephen Paul Lamb, age 17, disappeared from Seaside, Oregon on May 11, 1968. Stephen resided in Weston and attended Weston High School. He vanished from Seaside and accounts vary as to whether there was a class trip or it was senior skip week. He was last seen walking on the beach. You would think that there would be more detail and that other kids had seen him since a lot of kids were probably on the beach that day. And under what circumstances was he last seen? This is unlikely an a a ocean accident. Um, this, they believe that it's possible, some people have speculated that it's possible that he got washed out into the ocean. Um, one reason I doubt this is because he probably wasn't walking alone. And if the kids were in the water and they started hearing him crying for help, someone would have tried to help him, and they would have come forward and said he got swept away by the water. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He was reportedly last seen wearing a shirt, pants, and shoes, so it's very doubtful that he went into the water with his clothes on. Uh, Stephen's parents were living in American Falls, Idaho at the time of his disappearance. It's unclear what his living arrangements were at the time since he was still in high school. He was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Paul Lamb of American Falls, Idaho, missing since May 11, 1968 from Seaside, Oregon. He was 17. He was a white male, six foot tall, 125 pounds. He was last seen wearing a sports shirt, dark green paints, and white sneakers. He had brown hair and hazel eyes, and he wore eyeglasses. There are a few details available in his case. John Gaydosh. G-A-Y-D-O-S-H. John Xavier Gaydosh, age 30, disappeared from New Britain, Connecticut on June 1, 1963. According to directories at the time, John was a salesman. He was the son of John Thomas and Antoinette Gaydosh. John apparently left his home on 40 Wainwright Drive for work in the morning and never returned. It is unclear whether he arrived at his office or completed his route that day. The next day, his car was found near a pond. He was married and had two young sons at the time of his disappearance. His wife, Shirley, filed for divorce on the grounds of desertion in 1970. She later remarried and has since passed. Very little is known about the disappearance and doesn't appear to have been publicized there's no information on the condition of his car or where it was found. It also doesn't say what type of salesman he was, a root salesman. Was he a, a salesman or a delivery driver? Uh, it doesn't say what he sold, what, whose home he may have gone to someone's home who didn't like having a salesman there. Um, there's no mention of the name of the pond or how far it was from his home or his job. John would be 89 years old if he were still alive. Missing June 1st, 1963. He was a male, white, 5 foot 11 to 160 to 190 pounds. He had brown hair and often went by the name John Thomas. Gaydosh was last seen in New Britain sometime in June of 1963, he went to work and never returned home. There are very little details about his case. There's very little details about a lot of these cases, but I just like to mention them because there are so many. There are so many 
with so few. This is Charles Mansker, M-A-N-S-K-E-R. Charles Edward Mansker, age 27, was last heard from in October of 1968. He resided in Wichita, Kansas. Charles, who was commonly referred to as Chucky, grew up in the small farming town of St. Paul, Kansas. While he ordinarily lived with his parents, Charles and Norma, he spent his winters with his grandparents. In 1958, Charles began basic training in the United States Navy. Through 1963, Charles appears in local census and city directories as having lived with his parents. The last mention of Charles was in June of 1968, just four months before he vanished. He was included in a list of residents who had filed for bankruptcy at an address in Palisade in Wichita, Kansas. His occupation was listed as TV repairman. Although, do I, although I do like to provide background information of the people I write about, there's another reason I felt a need to do this. I found it very odd that while visiting his grandparents and filing for bankruptcy was newsworthy, there was zero mention of his disappearance. Not when it happened, not on any of the anniversary dates. There's absolutely nothing listed. This is a veteran who lived in this area his entire life. His parents were prominent his father eventually got into politics in the 1980s and doesn't even seem that there was even a traffic violation listed for anyone in the family. So unfortunately, there is no information on the circumstances of his disappearance. Both of his parents have passed away and his father is uh, listed as surviving him he has two brothers and a sister who I believe are still living. I'd like to know what in the world happened to this person. He was here, but now he isn't. Hopefully, this article will reach someone out there who might know something about him. He was last seen in Wichita, Kansas. He was born May the 1st, 1941. He was a white male, 5'11", 190 pounds. He had dark brown balding hair and hazel eyes. I don't know if there's any actual laws on the books that say a person can't just walk away from their life and just disappear on their own terms other than paying taxes or, you know, maybe they owe debts or child support or something like that. The government might want to know where are you know where is this person? Where did they go? For the most part, family members. Um, in this case, this Charles Mansker. He was a um, soldier or a sailor in the navy, and he went missing. There seemed to be very little detail about him. His family didn't. There didn't seem to be any police reports or anything that anyone could find of him having been reported missing. One question that I have is, did he actually go missing? Um, did the people in the neighborhood start looking for him and talking and asking questions? Did anyone actually go to the police and say, you know, I haven't seen my son or my brother in quite a few weeks or whatever? I don't know. During that time, you know, we didn't have internet, we didn't have social media, we didn't have cell phones to connect people on a constant, you know, oh, they're active right now, they're online, so you know they're there. Maybe he just went off, maybe he got some kind of job as a self-employed person. I don't know. At that time, and, and this family seemed to be in the newspapers a lot. They said that his father later got into politics. I don't know the standing in the community of his, his grandparents and parents, but is it possible that this guy had some kind of a mental breakdown, something maybe related to his time in the military, in the Navy, and maybe his family just kind of hid him away? You know, I mean, I'm not, 
I don't know that to be, you know, a fact, but it's a possibility. They didn't want him paraded around. Um, and, and, you know, at that time, mental health was not understood. Someone having a breakdown or something like that. It wasn't as understood. There wasn't as many treatments for it. And it was thought to be like this really taboo thing to talk about. And it ran in families is what people thought. And so it's possible that this guy had some type of mental health problems. Maybe his family just kind of stashed him away someplace. And that's really all. There's no known details of what he was wearing or who was even reported to have seen him last or if anyone even reported him missing and how he came to be considered a missing person I don't know if no one ever mentioned him he filed for bankruptcy and it was reported that his father later got into politics and they were prominent well known people so could it have been some kind of cover up whether or not he was harmed in some way, or maybe he just went off and, because he had filed for bankruptcy, maybe he just went off and disappeared. And uh, I'm assuming his Social Security number was never used. It doesn't say if he was ever declared dead or if his family had ever even contacted police to report him as being missing and you know Thomas Do Doherty D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y age 45 disappeared from Sioux City Iowa January the 12th 1961 he was last seen at the Metropolitan Cafe neither he nor his 1954 dark green Ford Tudor have ever been seen again Thomas had suffered injuries while serving in World War II, requiring him to have his hands amputated and replaced with the metal hooks. He had learned to normally function with his prosthetic hands, and he was still able to drive. His car was fitted to accommodate his disabilities. Despite this, Thomas took pride in his service to the country and was active in local veterans groups. Visiting with friends for breakfast at the Metropolitan Cafe was a frequent occurrence for him. Yet this time, it seems he just walked out the door and disappeared. Police performed air and ground searches of the area. Family and friends offered a reward. Bodies of water were searched, but no trace of Thomas or his car were ever found. Although I've heard several comments in response to this case suggesting that he had likely driven into a body of water, locals familiar with Sioux City find this theory unlikely. According to some of the locals, the only river large or deep enough to conceal a car was not accessible enough to accidentally drive into. It would be necessary to go through people's backyards. Police speculated that a 29-year-old man may have been involved in Thomas's disappearance. This man had been seen with Thomas at the cafe that morning and, with, and when questioned was described as a smooth talker who couldn't seem to tell the truth. The man told investigators that he had been in Chicago applying for jobs the night Thomas went missing and apparently passed a polygraph test. Police were unable to verify the man's alibi and still considered him a suspect, but didn't have enough evidence to charge him. The reporting in the case is a bit strange because the same article had said that Thomas was last seen leaving the cafe after eating breakfast, but it also states that the suspect claimed he was in Illinois applying for jobs that night. So what they're saying is, He's saying that Thomas, that he, he keeps referring to it being night time, saying he was in Chicago that night. Was it possible that he was with Thomas the night before, or the, the day of the breakfast and that the job applications took place that night or the night before and he just got confused about it or 
he continues to say night because he knows that Thomas didn't go missing in the daytime, that it happened that night. That's just a theory that they have. Thomas's surviving family have theorized that he may have been a victim of a robbery. In addition to owning a luxury car, he was known to display large rolls of cash. They're just saying here that they don't speculate that he was attacked by someone because he had these metal hooks for hands and they would think that someone would see that as being a weapon. But if someone came up behind him, you know, they could have knocked him out or something. He could have been thrown into his car and driven away. But where, whatever happened to the car? Maybe they drove it out into the country somewhere and then he went into the water. Um, his family still grieves wondering whatever happened to the man. He was last seen on Lower 4th Street in Sioux City in the morning hours of January the 12th, 1961. Um, his, his car, a Ford Tudor, was custom made and specifically outfitted. So if this car was ever found, it would have stood out. Um, he was born September the 29th, 1915. He was six foot tall and weighed about 150 pounds. He was slender and had thinning gray hair grayish brown hair, light blue eyes. He was an American with an Irish descent. He was a double amputee and had metal hooks on both arms. Um, he was last seen wearing gray paints, black shoes, a gray hat, a gray zippered jacket over a shirt. His license plate 97-11426 was an Iowa license plate. He nor his car have ever been seen again. And that was all there is on that case. And I just wanted to include these cases as some with little information. The older code cases, they kind of get swept under the rug and forgotten about. Sometimes somebody will ask that they be reopened. All of these cases were from the 1960s and they were all men. Some of them had served in the military in some Hatton. Some were college students and maybe like one article uh, theorized that maybe one or two of these men may have disappeared on their own because they didn't want to go into the military. These other men, maybe um, as so many men did who came back from war, Maybe they went through some kind of mental pro, you know, um, mental health challenges, and or maybe something did just happen to them. Who was known to carry a lot of cash? Maybe this young man that was with him. I, I don't know what the relationship was there. Were they speculating that he was someone that this guy was, had just taken in to help out? Was he someone who was down on his luck? Was he known to these other men at this breakfast? Were they speculating that there was some kind of relationship between the two of them? I don't know. Thanks for watching.